Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll be discussing the specific ways in which a tuxedo is different from a conventional business suit and how to put knowledge of those differences to good use in your outfits. <laughs> In the broad strokes, you're probably aware that a tuxedo and a business suit aren't the same thing. They're fundamentally different in terms of formality, of course, being that a tuxedo is the second most formal of all men's dress codes, following only the white tie dress code, which features a tailcoat as well as other style elements. And like the white tie dress code, tuxedos are really only to be worn for special events in the evening which is after sundown or 6 p.m., whichever comes first. Conversely, a regular suit can be worn in a much wider variety of situations. But how specifically does the tuxedo come to be seen as more formal than the business suit? In other words, what are the specific styling details that sets it apart? That's what we'll be covering in today's video. One more note before we jump in, today's video is going to feature a lot of callouts to other videos and articles we've done. If you don't see a card appear in the upper right hand corner of the video, don't worry, because the link will also be available in the video description. With that said, the first things we'll cover today are some general notes on terminology. Technically speaking, a tuxedo is still considered to be a type of suit. After all, the definition of a suit is an ensemble in which the jacket and trousers, as well as an optional waistcoat, are all made from the same material. Therefore, a tuxedo fits into this category, and fittingly, it's often called a dinner suit outside of the US. Phrased another way, all standard tuxedos are a type of suit, but not all suits are tuxedos. And why the additional clarification of standard tuxedos? Well, that's because the black tie dress code as a whole does have a few other permutations where the jacket and trousers of the ensemble don't necessarily always match. For more details on these specific subtypes of the dress code, you can check out the newly renovated black tie guide on our website here. But now, let's use the framework for a standard tuxedo as our guide and contrast that with how it differs from a regular business suit. We'll start first with the fabrics often used in each. For a tuxedo, black wool is the norm, although a particularly dark shade of blue, referred to as midnight blue, is also equally correct. In terms of the weave, the most common type is a fine barathea, but it can also be a twill weave, a plain weave, or sometimes a patterned weave like a fine herringbone. For a suit, worsted wool is most common, but you can also see flannel and even non-woolen materials. Lots of summer suits, for example, are made from materials like linen. And in terms of colors for suits, darker shades are most formal, but the sky is really the limit in the color of suits that you can see as a whole. Obviously, something brighter is going to be less formal, and you have several options for patterns as well. On that note, you can take a look at our guides to stripes in menswear here, and checked patterns in menswear here. Next, turning our attention specifically to jackets, let's first look at buttoning stances. For a tuxedo, you can have either a single-breasted or a double-breasted model. Single-breasted tuxedos most correctly have just one button, and double-breasted models will typically feature either two buttons or four. A suit can also be either single or double-breasted. Typical single-breasted suits will feature two or three buttons, though as few as one and as many as four or more do exist on some models, and double-breasted suits will most often have either four or six buttons. In terms of lapel styles, a tuxedo will most commonly feature either peaked lapels or a shawl collar. Notched lapel tuxedos are becoming more common these days, but they're not traditionally seen as being correct, since a notched lapel is inherently less formal than either a peak or a shawl. 
Conversely, a suit will usually feature either notched lapels or peaked lapels if it's single-breasted, though notched lapels are more common, and peaked lapels almost exclusively if it's double-breasted. You aren't going to see lots of shawl collars on typical suits, but of course, they are out there. Here's a related point, lapel facings. A tuxedo's lapels are almost always covered or faced in a different material than the main body of the jacket. Silk facings are most common these days, but in 20th century tuxedos, you would probably more often see a grosgrain facing. For a complete overview of lapel facing styles, the black tie guide has more information. Meanwhile, the lapels of a standard suit almost never have any type of special facing. This is usually just referred to as a self-faced lapel. Also, in the same way that the lapels of a tuxedo are often faced in a different material, so are the buttons. Typically, tuxedo buttons will be faced in either plain silk or grosgrain silk, usually in line with the lapel facings. Also, on some vintage tuxedos, the buttons aren't faced at all, but will be made from black bone, onyx, or another material. Meanwhile, suit buttons aren't usually faced, but can be made from a variety of materials. In terms of vents on the back of the jacket, a tuxedo is designed above all to flatter the wearer's form as much as possible, and therefore is best suited by having no rear vents whatsoever. If a tuxedo jacket does have vents, they will almost always be double vents. Suit jackets can be ventless, but this is increasingly uncommon today. More formal models of suits will feature the double vent, and less formal models will feature the sportier single vent. Moving now to pockets, a tuxedo jacket should feature just two hip pockets, both jetted, that is to say, decorated slits. A breast pocket isn't absolutely necessary, but if a tuxedo jacket does have one, just having one that's undecorated is most typical. A suit jacket's hip pockets can be jetted, they can also feature flaps, or they can be exterior patches. Also, some suit jackets will have a smaller third hip pocket, referred to as a ticket pocket. A breast pocket is also typical for suit jackets and typically matches the styling of the hip pockets, though not always. All right, those are the jacket differences covered, so next we can move on to trousers. As we said before, to qualify as a suit, an ensemble must have a jacket and trousers that are made from the same material. In addition to this, tuxedo trousers have a few distinguishing features of their own. Most notable is the braid that runs down the exterior of each leg, sometimes referred to by the French word galon. The braid can be plain satin, actual braided cord, or something that matches the facing of the lapels. As an aside here, traditional white tie trousers will typically feature a double braid on each leg, whereas traditional black tie trousers will feature a single braid. For more information about these differences, you can check out our PDF guides to black tie and white tie, available in the Fort Belvedere shop here. Meanwhile, standard suit trousers usually don't have any special detailing on their outside seams. Also important when discussing trousers, of course, is the method one uses to keep them up. Tuxedo trousers will most commonly feature buttons sewn onto the inside of the waistband to accommodate suspenders, alternately called braces. However, some more modern models of tuxedo trouser will also feature side adjusters or will feature adjusters in place of those suspender buttons. One common denominator for tuxedo trousers is that they shouldn't really feature belt loops. Wearing a belt with a tuxedo would be a clash in formality and generally just wouldn't be appropriate. Meanwhile, suit pants can certainly have belt loops and be worn with a belt, and they can also feature side adjusters or buttons for suspenders. On a related note, we recently covered the question of whether a man must always wear a belt with looped trousers in our video on 11 bad men's style rules to ignore. You can find that video here. 
In terms of pleats, tuxedo pants and suit pants are fairly similar, in that pleating is the more traditional option, but you're also perfectly able to wear flat-fronted styles. The choice here is yours. And for a video on whether or not you should wear pleated pants in general, you can go here. Finally, for trousers, we turn our attention to turn-ups or cuffs, as they're more commonly known in America. For tuxedos, as well as for white tie and morning dress, trousers should never feature turn-ups or cuffs, as they're simply too informal of a styling detail. On the other hand, suit trousers can have or not have cuffs, and it's completely up to the wearer's individual preference. Similarly, we've done a video on whether or not you should wear cuff trousers, and you can find it here. Now, moving back to the torso, let's talk waist coverings. Single-breasted tuxedos should always be worn with a waist covering of some kind. Although it's more popular today to see celebrities wearing just a jacket and trousers as a single-breasted tuxedo ensemble, this is poor form. Why? Because more likely than not, if you're wearing a single-breasted tuxedo without a waist covering, you're going to be able to see a little bit of your shirt peeking out from under the buttoning point of your jacket visually dividing your torso and compromising the ideal silhouette that black tie was designed to provide. With that said, the traditional waist covering for a single-breasted tuxedo is either a cummerbund made from silk to match the lapel facings, or a low-cut black evening waistcoat. There is historical precedent for wearing the white waistcoats that go along with white tie with your tuxedos, but this is a bit more of a vintage-inspired look, so that's something you should be aware of. A cummerbund is best suited to a shawl-collar tuxedo jacket, but it can also be worn with peaked lapels. The cummerbund is the more popular waist covering option in America. Also, keep in mind that your jacket should always be buttoned while standing when wearing a cummerbund, and you can unbutton it when seated. Meanwhile, the waistcoat is more well-suited to peak lapels, but can also be worn with either style. It's more popular in Europe, and it should be worn with an unbuttoned jacket. Waist coverings are traditionally not worn with double-breasted tuxedos, as those jackets are designed to remain closed at all times. Turning to standard business suits, though, single-breasted models can be worn equally correctly as either a two-piece or three-piece ensemble, and if a waistcoat is worn, it can either match the fabric of the jacket and trousers, or be worn in a contrasting fabric, in which case it would qualify as an odd waistcoat. And while there was a time in the late 19th and early 20th centuries where waistcoats were still worn with double-breasted suits, that's really no longer the case today. It could be a subject for a future video of ours, perhaps, but in the meantime, just know that you don't have to wear a vest when you're wearing a double-breasted suit. And on that note, for a recent video we've done on how to dress down a double-breasted jacket, you can go here. Next up, differences in shirts. A tuxedo shirt follows a pretty specific set of guidelines, and it should be as follows. Made from a white fabric, and featuring either pleats, a hidden fly front, or in a weave called pique or marcella. It should feature holes for shirt studs, typically either three or four, and should also have French cuffs, also called double cuffs, to accommodate cufflinks. And a tuxedo shirt should feature a standard turn-down collar. While black tie did once share the wing collar style with white tie, most sartorial authorities today agree that the wing collar is best left to the white tie dress code, and that the softer turn-down collar pioneered by the Duke of Windsor looks better with black tie. This is similarly the case for shirts with starched fronts and single link cuffs. While they were historically worn with black tie, today they're best reserved for the apex of elegance that is the white tie dress code. Meanwhile, a shirt to go with a standard suit has almost limitless options in terms of color, cuff and collar styles, button styles, and so on. You can take a look at our playlist on shirts here. 
Okay, those are all of the complex elements out of the way, and here's a quick rundown of everything that remains. In terms of neckwear, a tuxedo requires a black self-tied silk bow tie to match the lapel facings. After all, the dress code is called black tie for a reason. A black silk long necktie has become a popular alternative in recent decades, but really it has the overall effect of making the ensemble look less grand. For a video on how to properly tie a bow tie, you can go here. Meanwhile, your options for ties to be worn with suits are similarly quite varied. Might we suggest a couple of the models from the Fort Belvedere shop? You can find them here. If you're wondering how to select and pair a tie with your suit, you can take a look at these videos on finding the right colors for your skin tone, and also how to use the color wheel to build outfits effectively. Turning to footwear, you've got two main options for a tuxedo. Conservatively styled Oxford shoes, be they cap-toed, plain-toed, or hole-cut, or formal evening shoes, also called court shoes or opera pumps. As you might well imagine, pumps are the most traditional option, but Oxfords are the one most commonly worn today. In either case, your footwear must be black, and it should be made of either patent leather or highly polished calfskin or cordovan. Shoes for suits are, as you might have guessed, more highly variable. You can find our playlist on shoes here. And in terms of socks, black silk in an over-the-calf length is best for a tuxedo. For socks to be worn with suits, you've got more options. For a wide variety of socks for both tuxedos and suits, you can check out the Fort Belvedere shop. Finally today, let's talk about accessories. Harmonizing black, gold, silver, or mother-of-pearl studs and cufflinks go well with a tuxedo. Unless, of course, you're wearing a fly front shirt, in which case you'll just need the cufflinks and studs won't be seen. You could also wear studs and links featuring precious gems, but these are definitely a flashier choice. Your standard business shirt isn't going to take studs, of course, but it can certainly take cufflinks. For videos on building a cufflink collection and an overview of French cuffs in general, you can go here. The suspenders or braces worn with a tuxedo are most properly made from either black or white silk. Of course, though, since they're not really going to be seen by anybody other than you, you can feel free to wear something a little bit more playful if you'd really like to. If you're wearing suspenders with your suit, the sky's the limit. The traditional pocket square for a tuxedo is one made of plain white linen. White silk is also acceptable, and if you're looking for a way to add a subtle pop of color to your tuxedo, using a pocket square is a great way to do this. Meanwhile, pairing your pocket squares with your suits is similar in function to how you would approach it for ties. Which is to say, just pay attention to how things are harmonizing in terms of both color and overall level of formality. Finally, a carnation in either red or white is the most traditional boutonniere choice for a tuxedo, although you certainly could choose another flower of similar elegance, just so long as you make sure to keep it to one flower and not the miniature bouquets you'll often see at weddings. For suits, stick to just one flower and make sure your colors are harmonious. In conclusion then, while a tuxedo is, technically speaking, a type of suit, its specific styling details set it apart from its business-level brethren and give it an additional touch of elegance. As such, the considerations for wearing a tuxedo vary greatly from that of a standard business suit, as you might well imagine. Stay tuned for the second part in this video series, where those considerations will be discussed in greater depth. As you can see, I'm wearing a tuxedo in today's video. It's a vintage model from the brand After Six, and I believe it dates to the mid-1950s. It's midnight blue in color, double-breasted in configuration, and features no vents, and it also has grosgrain peaked lapels. As this tuxedo jacket is vintage, the buttons aren't faced, but they're simply made of black bone. 
The trousers are pleated and take suspenders, and they also feature an ornate braid down the side of each leg. I'm not wearing a waist covering today, of course, because the jacket is double-breasted, so I don't need one. My shirt has narrow front pleats, takes four shirt studs, and also has French cuffs to take cufflinks. The links and studs are all gold, and they feature onyx as the stone. My red carnation boutonniere, single-ended grosgrain bow tie, and black silk socks are all from Fort Belvedere, and you can find all of them in the shop here. Meanwhile, my pocket square is in plain white linen, and I've just got it folded in a square fold today so as not to be too busy with the carnation boutonniere. The suspenders are also black grosgrain silk, and they feature gold adjusters. And finally, my opera pumps are vintage models from Allen Edmonds, and they feature wide, flat bows. <laughs>